Uh, if you ever wondered how it is to talk on a conference, how to get to a conference, or you're having fear about, fears about it, Antonio will explain us how to overcome them and how to uh, successfully land a uh, talk on a conference. So give a warm welcome from Antonio. Cool. Thank you for being here. I don't know whether you are going to still think at the end that this is going to be a successful talk or not. That is one of my fears all the time. And it's more than three years already. I'm always scared on every talk, whether it's going to be a good one, bad one, or whether I'm going to be alive after the talk. So my acceptance criteria when I'm doing a talk, I only have one line. Are you alive after the talk? Yes. So that's a success for me. And sometimes, bonus, one person in the audience think that it was useful, and then could be the fulfillment of my uh, uh, target here, to get at least one saying, oh, it was a good, a good talk. The agenda is going to be, at the beginning, all the fears that I have about public speaking, and how I manage to overcome sometimes some of them. Hopefully, it will help some of you. Then, another fear that I had is I didn't know how to apply to speak at conferences, how to create the proper uh, information to submit to conference organizers. So the second part of the talk, it could be my thinking when I'm sending talks to conferences. And at the very end, imagine that you get accepted at the conference and you're going to give a talk. Yay! So some tips that no one told me before, and I found it really, really useful sometimes. Let's start with some of my fears. I'm going to talk only about five of them, because uh, we only have 45 minutes. And I want to talk about other things as well. Each time that I go to a conference, I always think that people there are the most expert on their domains. So for me, an expert is someone who can answer any question in less than 10 seconds, no matter the complicated question it is. I never consider myself that kind of person, because if you ask me a complicated question, probably I'm going to freak out and I say, uh, yeah, can you discuss with me later, maybe? And uh, maybe I will get a taxi before you get me. The thing is, I've been on a lot of conferences, and a lot of talks that are really, really interesting for me is when someone is explaining failures or explaining how it was a journey discovering a new technology or a new methodology. Because it's really useful for a lot of people to understand how to start. So you don't need to be an expert. Normally, I don't use a lot of um, quotes on talks. I only have one on this one. And for me, that's the value of uh, a talk with an expert, is to give us hope, not to tell us exactly how to do things. Because if someone is telling you exactly how to do things, you are not thinking. You are not trying to get better. And one of the motivations for me <laughs> about coming to conferences is becoming a better version of myself every day, the continuous improvement, but for myself. And it's, it's a motivation to try to go and to share my failures, share my experience when I'm learning the new stuff, or when one of my teams are struggling to, to find their pace or doing actually stuff. Right now, I'm more a Scrum Master and Agile Coach. I'm trying to get people to be better. So that would be a little bit weird if I'm trying to get others to be better if I don't try myself, right? I'm afraid of public speaking. I'm the youngest of seven siblings, so the little one that you see all your brothers and sisters really big, so probably I was already conditioned to be afraid because everybody else was bigger than me. This, that is only, I don't know, roughly 25 people or less, is more scary, actually, than when you have 400 people, at least for me. And the reason is because I can see the faces of all of you. <laughs> and that, it's that feeling of people staring at you, people 
people, mm. and even people sleeping, it happened, hopefully not today. <laughs> that is really, really um, um, a nightmare for me. But I realized that I managed to do in my professional career a lot of one-to-ones with managers discussing salary rates. That's really a scary thing. And it was actually, I was good on that. When you go to a new client and you need to present what you intended to do, that's scary because you have four people looking at you. My tip about this is, have you ever had the feeling that the speaker on a talk is looking at you all the talk and no one else? Any of you? Cool. I don't know if other speakers. In my case, if you think that I'm looking at you all the time, probably I am. And I'm going to tell you why. As I'm so scared of the people looking at me, I'm trying to find at the beginning someone that is projecting coolness or happiness or things like that. And it's like my, uh, an anchor for me. So when I'm a little bit scared, I look at that person, OK, it's still, it's still OK. <laughs> and that works for me. That works because I don't see the rest. When you have 400 people with the light, it's even easier because you don't see them. So you just, it's like when you are doing a rehearsal with an empty room, the room is empty because you don't see them. If you manage to have that mindset, it's easier. You notice already, my English is not perfect. I'm from Spain, so really, really bad start. For English is not the, my first language. It's not even my second one. I have lived nine years in France. Any French here? No. Cool. Have you ever heard someone from France speaking English before? Cool. So I'm not copying all the issues, but sometimes my tone of the voice is a mix of Spanish with French which is really confusing for the people in UK, that now I live in UK. And when I moved there, I wasn't able to understand anybody. I was able to understand everybody in the films from America, not UK. So I had to have some lessons softening my accent. Yeah, that's the soft version of my accent. <laughs> it was worse. But about the English, I realized one thing. In most of the conferences, if you check all the speakers here, how many people are actually English speakers? With the it's the first language. 20% maximum? So it's not a problem to give talks if your English is not perfect. And sometimes, at least for me, I'm even more enjoying when someone is making an effort to give a talk on a different language. Don't be afraid of that. We are 80% here. And if you're understanding me today, probably I would be able to understand you the next day that you're here. Okay? And it's, again, continuous improvement for yourself. I did lessons to try to get my accent softer a little bit. And I can try to motivate you to try to get your accent soft. It's something to improve, right? I speak really fast. I'm from Spain. That's the slowest version of myself. <laughs> so if it's really fast today, raise both hands. Then I know that I need to cool down and speak slower. If you are really bored and I'm speaking really fast, don't do anything. And in 20 minutes, we are done. Okay? <laughs> the thing is, when you speak fast, it's really complicated to realize that people don't understand you. You have a good thing. When people speak fast to you, you understand them really well, because you are able to, to think at the same space. So one tip that I got from my softening accent lessons, and now, especially now that I have a two years old daughter, imagine when you are trying to give a speech that you have the food for the baby, a lot of spoons, take one spoon, information. Another spoon, information. If you try to do that to a baby, it's not going to work, right? You are going to have all the food on you. 
Even if you do one by one, you can have the food on you. So that would be my tip. It was really amazing, even though you realize that I'm forgetting the spoons all the time. And then one of my fears is I'm asthmatic. Any asthmatic here? Cool. I'm really happy for you. Being asthmatic, I don't know if you have anybody in the family asthmatic. Imagine that you have a suitcase and you have to go five floors, the stairs, with the stairs, with a big suitcase. The feeling that you are when you feel when you arrive finally, that's my normal breathing. So if I have to do the five floors, it's even worse. But that's my normal breathing. And if I watch myself on a video, on a talk, everybody else maybe is listening to my words. I can hear me breathing, only my breathing all the time. And I'm really, really worried that you can hear only the breathing. I have some kind of revelation on one conference. Does anybody know, know her? Probably not, so it's okay to say no. She's Sharon Steed. I was in a conference two years ago in Tallinn, 400 developers opening keynote about empathy. She is a heavy stutterer. She is stuttering all the time, giving an opening keynote for her 400 developers. I was amazed. I was, and I'm worried because maybe they're going to hear my breathing and she's able to give an opening keynote, being a stutterer. It was one thing that she was saying about empathy and being empathetic and trying to share your limitations with others, not to say, oh, poor one, no. It's try to explain to them what it feels for you, your day to day. If you manage to realize, with the example of going with a suitcase, how is my day to day breathing, maybe you realize why I'm worried about my breathing all the time on the talk. It works for everything, not only for being asthmatic. It works for the accent. I'm explaining to you and trying to get you to imagine why, how it is to have an accent like that. It's the same with asthmatic. So I'm always with an inhaler all the time. So if there is a problem, my black bag is over there, the inhaler is there. Not the pink one, the blue one. Okay? The pink one is a different one. <laughs> you may hear my breathing. And sometimes I'm, I might need to shut up for five seconds. The thing is, I'm from Spain. We joke about ourselves all the time. And I have a colleague early years of my career. Once I was a project manager. Okay, cool. No, no tomatoes. And on one day that I was having a really bad day, he told me, that, you know, when you're breathing like that, and knowing that now you're the project manager, you always remind me of someone. <laughs> Normally, each time that I have given this talk, from this time, Till the end, my accent is no longer an issue for you. You don't hear my breathing, and you understand how I'm speaking, even if it's fast. If it's not the case, let me know at the end. If you understand it, and it's like magic, and it's working again, please let me know. Those are my fears. You can have others. I have more, but one of my fears as a, I was a former developer, and I always wanted to have all the information up hand. I decided, OK, let's go for conference speaking. How do I get to a conference? I didn't know what to do, how to contact people, how to send things. It was really complicated. I managed to get help from other speakers. But you need to submit title and descriptions so, to conferences. And at the beginning, you might think, OK, I have the greatest idea. I'm going to submit it. They're going to accept it because it's great. They are probably not. That's 
real data from this year. Cosmos in Madrid, 70 slots, 857 submissions. DevConf, Krakow, 32 slots, 351 submissions, and so on. That means that only 10% or less of the submissions are going to be accepted. So when you decide to start submitting, you need to be ready to not speak at the conference and to get rejected a lot of time. More data from previous year. They have 1,000 submissions. And they even publish on the box volume the type and everything. I suspect that this year after that, probably there are more people submitting Ignite talks because last year there were only eight submissions and seven got in. So I need to get in touch with organizers. What do you submit? Well, title and description. Sometimes you need to submit more things. And that's the key thing of a talk. When I created my first talk, I created the whole talk, all the slides, I was doing rehearsal and everything, and I didn't dedicate enough time to the abstract. That talk was rejected all the time. That, you need to convince the program committee that with the title and with your description, someone is going to buy a ticket for the conference, and someone is going to go to that room to hear your talk. So that's your selling point. I'm not an expert on marketing, but that's your minimal marketable product. It's the minimum thing that you need to do to market your product. Your product is your talk. The submissions, depending on the conference, there are going to be some blind process that they remove name and they only see title and description. However, that's not always the case. In some cases, they request for a link to a previous talk. So if they can see you, even if your name is not there, it's not that anonymous, right? And depending on the title and the description, program committees, half of them probably are the speakers and conferences. So they know a lot of speakers, and they know if someone submits seven deadly sins of microservices. There is a big chance that that's Daniel Bryan from UK that has been spoken, I don't know, 20 or 30 times that talk. So it's not anonymous because they know that. You need to choose your subject, of course. Keep it relevant to the conference or the soft skill or generic things like this one to submit it. If you submit something about blockchain to a JavaScript conference and things like that, it's, you are with less chances to get. If you are submitting something about how cool is JavaScript on a project management conference, if you get there, tell me how, and I will try to apply the same. Title and description. One of my talks it was project management and DevOps. I never, ever gave that talk. It was never accepted. I have one talk. It's project management from Stone Age to DevOps. In essence, it's the same talk. And it got accepted eight times in the same year because of the title. When you're attending a conference, if you see a generic title or something that is more different, you are more leaning toward the different one because the others you can find on YouTube, right? So you need to sell yourself. It's a long process. The most complicated is the first talk or the conference. Because other conferences, can you, can you explain to us your previous experience at conferences? So on those, probably you're not going to be accepted. There are some conferences that they want to have more uh, new speakers. So they, they do half of the speakers without any experience and the other half with experience. My process now to create talks. I change a little bit. I no longer do the whole talk. I'm going to explain my process now. Well, first of all, you need to define why you want to speak at the conference. 
There are different reasons. If you have someone with a job title, advocate, the evangelist, things like that, their job is actually to speak at conferences. So it's a good reason to speak at conferences if your job is actually doing that, right? There are some independent contractors. That is a way to get job gigs. So uh, you can uh, contact with clients, get uh, more jobs when you are here. In my case, it's a little bit different. I don't want any job from you, even though my company would be more than happy and uh, please come to me. <laughs> I learned a lot in meetups in London, where I live now. I learned a lot of conferences, and I realized that sometimes listening to someone else's experience motivates me to change something different. Maybe it's not about following what that person is explaining. It's the change of my mindset that I get after the conference or after the talk. So I was getting a lot of energy and a lot of knowledge from that. And I was thinking, you know, it's, it's a little bit selfish from me that I'm getting that from meetups, from conferences. And maybe if I'm sharing my experience, someone else can get that motivation or that small path. One idea, not what Anthony was saying, because it was probably rubbish, but now I have an idea after I hear Antonio. So that's motivation. You need to target, usually, small meetups, small conferences. For people living in UK, conferences in UK are really, really complicated to get inside. First of all, the venues in UK are really, really expensive in London. So, and the prices for a ticket at a conference in London Sometimes it could be salary here for three or four months. So, of course, they're not going to accept a lot of new people. They need the stars, and I'm not one of those. Probably Dave would be on those conferences because he's amazing. <laughs> in some countries here in Eastern Europe, they are more than happy to have speakers with not a lot of experience, but coming from a different country, because it's what they're looking for, experience from a different country, to see a different point of view. And they're more willing to actually accept people from different countries. And you have less people submitting, so you need to increase your chances. In the conference that there are 1,000 submissions, probably I'm not going to get there ever. Well, maybe one day. Here, I don't know the number of submissions, but if it's 1,000 among here, I could be, oh, but probably it wasn't 1,000. Some conferences, you might need to submit one year, but you really want to be there the following year. You only submit this year because the program committee is going to remember your name for the next year. Because if they don't know your name, probably you're not going to be there. Different talks ideas, case studies, tech exploration, and some themes uh, talk. The leadership ones, from my experience, unless your role title has a C, like a CTO, CEO, CIO, things like that, it's really, really complicated, unless you are one of the Agile Manifesto creators, that they can do anything about leadership because they are amazing. Depending on what you choose, if it's a case study of tech exploration, target the proper conference. When you, there are conferences specific about an architecture or uh, about the technology like containers or even blockchain. The business or soft, soft skill talks, they do have also specific um, conferences, but sometimes there are more and more conferences that are focused for developers that they start adding more soft skills talks because and then if you're a good developer, you can learn any technology easier. But sometimes it's, you need to go beyond technology. So that could be a good idea of a talk. When, you, when I'm looking for a talk idea, I not any crazy idea, anything. Sometimes it was scam mastering of pain. Of course, I didn't do a talk about that. And a lot of things. When I created this idea, it was at DevOps Days Riga. They do in the afternoons. It's an open space, so everybody 
submit ideas to have a catch up with others. And one of the ideas was become a conference speaker. So one of them wanted to know this process, wanted to know how to fight the fear of public speaking and things like that. So that was, I noted down, and the following year I started saying, actually I noticed that in several conferences, there's always someone asking one of the speakers, probably not me, the good ones, how do you manage to be here? So I've created the talk. I'm not an expert. My job is not actually the conferences. I have to fight with previous employers to actually be able to be at conferences. Now I managed to have an agreement of three, four conferences a year with my current employer, but it's not my job. It's only that I want to share experience, and hopefully someone will tweet one day, after the talk with Antonio, I managed to submit one talk, and it's accepted. Well, please be one of those, because I, I need one like that for my next, next time of the conference. For the moment, I'm not getting one. When you have all the ideas and you are refining the list, look if there are similar talks. If you are going to be creating a talk about microservices, look. Is there any talk that is similar to you? Yes. In Europe here, yes. Why your talk is going to be different than that one? If you don't have answer for that, maybe do a different one. If no one else is speaking about that, we have two cases. It's really good thing, and you find the new idea that uh, is going to get you spot of the conferences. Or is that that bad idea that that's the reason no one is speaking about? Ask college, ask someone else, the community on some meetups if that idea would, would be enough to be on the meetup, if they could be happy attending a talk speaking about that. And then pick one, focus on one at a time. You need to approach the conferences, so good title and description. With the title and the description, as I'm not British, now I always ask several people in my company or some colleagues first to correct all my grammar mistakes that probably I should have asked them to correct on the slides. I think I have some. And then you will ask them, would you go to a conference and pick that talk? And if you're still having some, yes, yes, then submit that idea to the conference. Some conferences, they have uh, all the dates about the submission start this day, finishes on this one, uh, you will announce on this one. But other conferences, they submit all the time, and if we like it, you are going to be accepted till we complete. So if you submit the first days, you have more chances, because sometimes it's good, but not enough, it's good, but not enough, and at the end, well, we don't have something else, so it's good enough. If you submit the last day, there are less, less spots. As for feedback to the program committee, not every conference answer. But when they do, usually they give good feedback about why it's not on, on the program this year. Sometimes they, they can tell you, the talk is really good, and probably last year you would be uh, on the program. It's only that this year they could be all, uh, other more pre interesting, and you were just the third uh, on, on the top list uh, that they uh, wouldn't get it. Practice. When you have a talk, practice. Practice yourself out loud. I'm pretty sure that when you are trying to practice any talk or any speech, you're practicing in your mind, right? And when I'm giving a talk to myself, in my mind, I can tell you, it's the best talk ever, even better than Dave's this morning. It was the best talk in history. Then you try it out loud, and you record yourself, even if it's only the voice. You, start, you will start realizing that it's not the best. You will start realizing where to improve it. If you watch yourself in a video, you will realize all the bad things 
and you are going to realize even better than anybody else. Because you are the only one who knows exactly how the talk should be. The good thing from you, for you, any day that you are going to be giving a talk, all of you, you don't know exactly how this talk should be. And of course, I'm going to tell you, it should be like it, like it is right now. Everything that I'm saying, every movement, I was thinking about that. No. <laughs> but you don't know it. So don't be afraid of, ah, oh, I got blank. If you see a lot of opening keynotes or even experienced speakers, sometimes they stop and they put like a, to make some momentum, right? Not all of them, but some of them already told me that, you know that? When I was doing that, I completely had blank mind. But they don't realize because you just put a face of an interesting guy. Oh, okay, yeah, this. And you continue. Because they don't know that you actually have a blank mind. That's the beauty of it. Don't be worried about forgetting things. Say something else, and it's going to be OK, because they don't know what to expect. Unless you are putting an abstract of uh, 2,000 words uh, with everything that you're going to say. But don't worry, you won't get accepted if you do that. Practice in front of audience. If you do on your company lunch and learn, it's a good way. People will tell you at the end of the talk all the mistakes, where to improve. You will realize as well if you are saying, mm, Mm, mm. At the beginning, I was saying that quite a lot. They told me that, and now I'm reducing that. Hopefully, I'm not saying that today. If I'm saying it, just let me know after, not in the middle. <laughs> because when you are conscious of that mistake, the first three, four talks, you're going to be enforcing not to say it. Then you're not going to even think about it, and you are going to stop saying it. Usually, I would say, um, 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 on these two minutes at least four or five times. Yeah, I'll just say it, well, because I want it. Ask for feedback. I'm going to ask at the end as well if there is anything that you didn't like. I want to know the things that you didn't like. On one conference, I got feedback. One of the attendants said the speaker was moving a lot, and it was complicated to follow. So now I just got a rule that is half meter from here, half meter from there. I usually I'm not moving more than that. But if no one could ever tell me, how could I know? Now I am always asking. Ask feedback to the conference organizers if you get to, to a conference. I don't know if here there is a feedback form or not. Some conferences they do. Um, ask for feedback. And I will ask uh, some of you if I remember your faces, which is a little bit complicated because my memory is always. You need to build a brand now. If you want to be in conferences, you need to make yourself not as famous as. Dave Snowden, but that need, you need to have some data that is going to back, back up that actually you know a little bit about the subject or you have some experience speaking. When I created my Twitter account, it was just a couple of months before I started transmitting talks. It was a colleague from my company. He told me that. You need Twitter account. There are a lot of conferences that they announce the call for papers and anything on Twitter. You can do different ways. One is put things that are going to create a lot of controversial thinking, not like that. Or you just retweet nice things, tweet, uh, I just wrote a, a blog about this, and uh, you can find it here. If you get to the conference, put your Twitter handler on every slide. And I was, why? And he told me, you know, 
Now everybody has cameras. If they want to put a picture of one of your slides, probably not mine because they're a little bit awful, but, but if you have the Twitter handler, they are going to tweet to the right person and not someone else. And it's a good way for them to remember you and after the conference to check your Twitter, maybe to start liking things, to talk about that to someone else. It's publicity, it's marketing for free. You put it there, someone make a picture. I was on this boring talk, uh, publicity, but you are there. Share your slides after the talk. So depending on the Wi-Fi, after my, the talk, I'm going to share the slides. And share videos of your previous talks. However, there is an asterisk there, right? I explained before that some conferences, they always ask for a link to a previous talk. I was unlucky that on my first year giving talks, only one conference recorded my talk, my first ever talk. Well, I was moving over there, speaking really fast, doing mm, mm, mm all the time, but I had to submit something. Of course, I was rejected a lot of times. And I was on one conference with uh, Mark Smalley. I don't know if you know him. It's an really amazing speaker. So if you see him at the conference, go. It's really good. After the talk, he came to me, oh, I enjoyed your talk. It was really yourself, sharing yourself and your experience. It was really, really good. And it was in Riga. Have you ever been to Tallinn before? Yeah, that was my reaction as well. Uh, why someone asked me if I've ever been to Tallinn, that is a, in a conference in Riga, different country, right? I didn't understand. I had him on LinkedIn, and two days after the conference, I was saying um, something, conferences in Tallinn, bam. And there's one conference there. I check, it was the following month. There's still a couple of slots, and he was part of the program committee. I said, hmm, okay, I submit, the same talk. Five minutes after the submissions, I got a message from him on LinkedIn. Oh, I'm really happy that you submitted. I cannot promise that it's going to be accepted because it's more people on the program committee, but I did share with them that I enjoyed your talk. And by the way, I owe you an apology. Because when you submitted to that other conference, I was the one saying no, because the video that you submitted, it was awful. They said, well, it was the only one that they had. Oh, well, that explains everything, but don't ever submit that video again. <laughs> Marketing, publicity, network. Social media, follow speakers, follow conferences, contact speakers at conferences on Twitter. Sometimes you might get one of them to be your mentor and to help you. And it's a good, valuable uh, feedback if you submit a, a title and abstract to a famous speaker and say, no, that's not good. You know that they don't have to spend more time. Where do I submit papers? Well, there is a website called Paper Call. That's the process for normal people like me. I'm pretty sure that Dave is a different. Dave only open email. Could you please come to our conference? Uh, can you explain our, uh, your rates? I'm not on that. <laughs> I need to check. So a lot of conferences uh, published there. They call for papers. There is a big group in Germany that also do some conferences in UK. That is JAX. That's the, um, the URL for the call for papers. DevOps days, they have uh, also an, a URL for submitting papers. Code motion, that's. And Twitter, just look on Twitter for conferences and you will find. You might even discover a conference called HipCon in Serbia. And then, be clever. When you submit, if it's the first time ever to a conference, Never been to Serbia, so in order to remediate that, I've just submitted a couple of talks to HipCon. Here we go, over here. So either 
I don't know if that helps or not, but at least it shows uh, that you're engaged with the conference uh, in general, with uh, all the conferences in space. Imagine you got accepted finally. No one explained to me anything, and they're really, really easy tips. Bring your own clicker. If you use the one that the conference organizers have, there is a chance that you've never used it. And you're going to advance twice or three times and go back twice. <laughs> have you ever seen a talk of someone that is going too fast and low? In vain, it's a time to make the joke about Darth Vader, and you see Darth Vader before the inhaler. No, right? Your clicker. You are used to it. You know exactly the strength that you press and things like that. If you use a Mac, that's a pain for conference organizers. Mac, you need adapters, and not all the time the same adapter is going to work. I'm bringing two different adapters. Some days this one is working, some days that one, and some days none of them, and I don't know why. But at least if I'm bringing mine, there's a big chance that it's going to work. Check the room before. Usually I'm always uh, on the talk before mine, even if it's something that maybe it's not what I'm uh, interested in, but I can see whether the lights are affecting the previous speaker whether the sound sometimes is funny or not, whether the people can see me, whether I would be able to see them or not, and things like that. And you can get more or less more familiar and then less afraid of speaking if you know already the room. If there is problems, technical problems with the previous speaker, you know it might happen. If it happens, well, life is hard sometimes, but you are ready because you know that it might happen. Don't target everybody in the audience. I'm pretty sure that not all of you are like, like this talk, and it's OK. Target a small group, even if it's only one person. It's really complicated to give a talk and to have absolutely everybody in the room saying, oh, amazing guy. Well done. That's not maybe to someone else, but that's not going to happen, at least at the beginning when you are really afraid, speaking fast, saying um, 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 um all the time, you are not going to have everybody saying, yay. Not having questions is okay. Depending on where you are giving the talk, the culture is different. In some countries, people don't like to ask questions. In some countries, they prefer to even think a little bit more and maybe come to you later to ask you the question. Even Dave, he only had one question, and it was really the ghost of not having any. Having a lot of questions, maybe it's not a good thing either, but better probably. <laughs> People on mobile and laptops aren't always bored. Right now, they can be Twitter. They can even check in your LinkedIn profile. Or maybe they are bored, but they pay to be here, so they, they have the right to use their time as they wish, right? So don't be worried about that. Hopefully, if they are bored, one of them will let you know at the end of the talk, and you can change it for next time. Remember to breathe. That's a, for me. I should put probably that on every slide. And the most important, enjoy it and a smile, because if you are here, you did it. You managed to be at the conference, and you're giving a talk. The first time is complicated, but after, it's OK. And now I'm going to try. Probably the pronunciation is going to be really awful. Smala. That's thank you, Sally. <laughs> One minute. One question, knowing that not having questions is okay. <laughs> I'm making life easy. Hi. Uh, I'm going to spoil it for you. Awesome talk. Thank you. <laughs> Got one. Yes. <laughs> and I actually have more questions, but I'm just going to give you one. Do you consider yourself 
in your private life, an introvert or an extrovert? Introvert. And actually, giving talks, it helps me for the rest of the conference to talk to people, especially in countries that I don't speak the language. Because hopefully, one of you, or maybe you later, is going to start asking me questions. So it's going to make my life easier, because most of the time I know what is the subject about, so I can answer. And, but most of the time, if I don't have any question, I'm going to be on the corner eating. There is a lot of food, so it's a problem. And not talking to anybody. When it's in England or France or Spain, I can sometimes say something. Here, I could probably say in Slovak, because my wife is Slovak, yeah, how about in Lentro, who was Slovensky? And yay, and that's all. So you would understand me, but if you answer to me, Any, any more questions, or should we go to the 10-minute break, then we're going to start with another talk? Or yeah, That's it. Thank cool. you, Antonio. Thank you.